From Chicago and the city of Stoke-on-Trent, this is the Classic Lenses Podcast. Hello and welcome to episode 97. My name is Simon Forster and I'm joined by Johnny Sisson. Hello, Johnny. Hey, good morning. Well, and as you've already guessed, we haven't got Perry G. And uh, Perry G cannot be with us because he's having to endure a trip to Bali with his girlfriend at this moment. <laughs> So, uh, I, th- I thought Rock on, Perry G. Yeah, I thought so with you, Perry. Um, but uh, somebody's got to do it. Yeah, yeah. Oh. <laughs> oh dear, that could be taken a few ways. Uh, but let's move on. Um, and uh, what I can say, though, um, and it's something I've not said for quite some time, is uh, because we can also go over to Gainesville, Florida, uh, because we're Yay. also being joined <laughs> by Anthony Rue. Hello, Anthony. Hello, everybody. It may not be Perry, but I did shoot my Leica M3 with the Sumer at 51.5 last week. Well done. Well done. <laughs> <laughs> it's great great to have you back, Anthony. Um, you are you're with to be back. You were with us in, I've got to hear, episode 56. Um, and that was back in February this year. And uh, for those people that haven't listened to that show, um, it's well worth going back and having a listen to that. Um, and I'd also wish to apologise to anybody that does go back for the fact that I left the intro music going all the way through its full three minutes um, at the start of that. So I, and I was just listening to it earlier. I was thinking, oh, my word. No, no, make it stop. Um, uh, but yeah, so uh, do apologise about that. But do have a listen to that. But that was a that was a really fun show. Um, just a, as a as a recap, uh, that was one where uh, Carl uh, came to see you in your uh, was it at your coffee shop or was it at your home? No, it was at my house. Ah, right, yeah. Because of them, the idea was it was going to be at the coffee shop. And the noise levels were just too high, um, so we went to they went to your house and then found out that the two of is it, am I right in thinking you you couldn't actually record in the same room together? Was that, was that right? right? We, we were getting echo because of uh, the the different types of microphones we were using. We were getting too much cross speed, and so I left Carl with all my cameras yeah. and I went back into the office. <laughs> I think there was uh, there was definitely a thought that he was like some kind of ruse he had actually set up to to make sure he could be alone in 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 that room. With yeah, I came back and like half the cameras were off the shelf and on the table in front of him. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, now that that was great fun. So um, do do go back if you've not listened to that, or you might want to re-listen to it. Um, episode fifty six back in uh, February this 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 year. So uh, yeah, it's it's fantastic to have you have you back. But there was lots of unfinished business from last time so uh, we we may well cover some of those things and some of the some new things no doubt well thank you for having me back it's uh, always a pleasure okay well let's um let's head over to chicago uh, which i've uh, i've i've heard is actually quite cold at the moment so uh, how's how's things uh, over there okay i don't know if it's crazy cold this morning actually it's i mean i woke up and there's snow there's a dust of, of, of snow everywhere, but uh, temperature-wise, I will tell you... Oh, I'm, st- I'm still set to a different location. Hold on a second. Where's Chicago? That's Miami. That's Minneapolis. I'm scrolling. There's Munich. There's Hayward, Wisconsin, where it's 15, 42 in Londonderry. Uh, <laughs> I have all these other locations in my, in my weather thing. And none of them are Chicago, so I have no idea. Well, I, just, uh, I was just going to say that though. The, you, there's a there's an app that I use for the weather in the UK, and I'll type something in, and it will before it gives me the local one, it might give me the uh, the weather of the same named location in the United States. And this is a BBC app made in. Britain. Oh, that's funny. That's, that's what? There's a Stoke on Trent in the US no, somewhere. No, no, no. I already know what the weather's like in Stoke on Trent. Uh, but okay, if, <laughs> but if I <laughs> if I I'll, I'll look out the window the old the old fashioned way. Um, but if I'm going somewhere, I think I think uh, I'm not sure it was Castleton or Buxton or something like that. And uh, it, it never it never comes up with the one that I want it to be. The one that's like within <laughs> miles of my house. No, thousands of miles away instead. That's hilarious. Well, it is a very pleasant 26 degrees here this morning. Uh, which is something else in Celsius. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, but that's not bad. I mean, it's, you know, it's, it, it doesn't snow if it gets too much colder than that. Oh, hold on, hold on. Settings. I'll go to Celsius just for you, Simon. Which we'll minus to... something. Minus three. Yeah. That's not bad. Yeah, it was, I think zero. <laughs> zero is... <For> yourself. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
It's a, it's a bit warmer in Florida, I take it, at the moment. Yeah, that, that, it'd be a bit of a crisis if we were at minus three right now. Yeah. Yeah, yeah right. Oh, uh, so yeah. So no, it's all good. It's it's uh it's just it's it's just gray gray and gray and gray and gray. Gray on gray today. So so what have you been up to in this last week? Because you've not actually been spending that much time in, in the cold of Chicago, have you? No. Uh I have been in sunny for the most part, uh Southern California of all places, where I've never been before. Um uh, out there for a funeral, so not the cheeriest, I guess, of circumstances, but nonetheless, uh, was away from Chicago for four days or so. Um, so that that was interesting because it's a completely different landscape for me uh, with actual like mountains with snow up on the top and peaks up poking through the clouds and all that. Um, so it looks very, very different from Chicago because it's not flat. Um, so yeah, it was a, it was, it was a very great, it was a great place to visit. Um, despite the circumstances. Uh, <clears throat> so aside from being in the, um, in the Riverside, California area, um, I made a, it was a day trip yesterday. Well, was it guess yesterday? No, day before. <clears throat> day trip to uh, Oceanside, California, and Carlsbad area. So got to actually go to the Sealy Pacific Ocean, which was very cool. Um, and got to spend a day out at uh, March Airfield, where they have about 80 uh, aircraft on display in a big museum devoted to aviation. So that was a lot of fun. So I, I did a lot of, um, did a lot of shooting. Um, most notably I shot, uh, a Bessa six by nine folder quite a bit. And that thing performed beautifully, except when I forgot to focus in the right place. Which version? Uh, uh that's the version one. The thirties. <clears throat> What's that? The 1930s version. No, it's actually the fifties version. Okay. okay. Uh, the the Bessa one, the it's marked Bessa one, right? right, right. As opposed to just Bessa, because there's like there's actually a couple of versions of the earlier, right? Than that of the just the Bessa, uh, but this is the Bessa, you know, one. I guess right. we, we would probably call it Bessa Mark one today or whatever. <laughs> um, it's what I was shooting yesterday myself. Yeah. So that's and I love that camera. I think it's a yeah, I, do too. I think it's a primo primo folder with the interlock and that you know uh, the double exposure prevention etc cetera, etc cetera. so it's it's a really nice camera um yeah so that that performed really well and i i got i shot with it more than i thought i would and actually pretty much more than everything else i took with me so i didn't actually take that much stuff i think we're going to talk though about travel when perry gets back is that right i think that's Simon? the plan yeah 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 so i won't get into like the full the full kit but i did take a couple of other cameras and um yeah, it all, it all went very well. It was still a little bit more than I wanted to take, but we'll, again, we'll talk about that. We'll talk about I, that I was going to say on, on that subject, is it, is it? am I right in thinking that we talk about travel every two weeks, or it seems to, <laughs> since, since Perry's joined the show? <laughs> more often than we used to. I, I have not, this is the first time I've left Chicago in, oh God, I don't know how long. It's the first time I've been on an airplane anywhere for about almost 10 years. So... Uh, I, I do not get a chance to travel very often, um, and I, it was more of a moral support mission for uh, people involved. So, um, not really a vacation. It's kind of like it was a, you know, a trip with another purpose that I I snuck camera time into. <laughs> so, so the the camera stuff couldn't couldn't be the center of attention for me or that primary activity it was more of a ancillary thing. I got to sneak in at moments, you know, yeah. so that, that changes the whole, you know, the whole, uh, kind of approach to photography, I, I would say it does for me anyway. Yeah. Yeah. It's, I mean, ultimately it was, it was going to be a, a, a secondary activity, although, uh, right. Perhaps right. You, I don't know if you're going to go in, into some of the things that you that happened there, but uh, I know that you did some 
um, you're allowed to do some interesting yeah, I, photography. I, about like I said, I don't know if you want to talk about that this time. Or- yeah, I mean, I, I, I did actually shoot uh, the, the burial um, for the family, which was, you know, kind of a, it's one of those, uh, it's one of those activities that um, is very interesting to do because it calls for a high level of kind of decorum and um trying to be less noticeable right um because you don't want to you don't want to in any way just distract or get in the way of what's going on um so i so i did that and um it was actually really it was beautiful sort of service and you know the weather was absolutely gorgeous um and i honestly i shot it well i shot it with the um with the Rolly 35 and I, I but also shot it with the um Fuji X100S which is the camera I shot by far the most on this trip because it was just you know it was easy um and I was also taking a lot of photos I wanted to be sh- able to share quickly with uh family and not have to have them wait until I took my sweet ass time processing everything and scanning it so I I shot a lot with the X100S and it was just Excellent. I mean, I, I, I'm, I can't believe how well this camera still performs. I got it in 2012, um, and it's just knock on wood. It, it's just cruising right along, um, and performing great. And the images out of it, I think, are just really, really excellent. So, so that was that was cool. I haven't shot this much with that camera in years, actually. So it was. Uh, a really good experience. And I, I have to say, I mean, that's as close to perfection for me as it's ever going to come with a digital camera because it it really does handle like uh, a manual, you know, like a real camera. So, and I, even to the extent that I shot a lot of it, a lot of manual focus with it this time around. Um, so it was, yeah, anyway, it was, uh, it was an interesting experience to, to, to rely so heavily on that camera for something like this. I, I was, was going to say, there's um, there's a there's a lot of love out there for for the X100 cameras, all of them. Not, um, yeah. And uh, I was listening to the uh, Grainy Days podcast uh, yesterday. Um, just they interviewed um, Frank Thorpe the Fifth. Uh, he's an interesting photographer. Um, he's, he shoots uh, film at. He's been shooting film at the impeachment hearings. And, oh, okay. Uh, but I'm going to talk a little bit more. Probably mention that a bit more on the next la- uh, large format photography podcast. But one of the things that came out of that, uh, listening to uh, Frank, um, Dustin, and Ed Conde. I'm not sure if Ed Conde has one or not, but I think he does. Um, but they were all talking about the X100 cameras themselves. And uh, um, they 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 absolutely love them. So uh, doing- yeah, I mean, I, I can understand that. I mean, that th- I guess the the main thing for me is that I can shoot it alongside film cameras, and I don't have to completely shift brain like brain space into a digital way of shooting. If that makes sense, I don't have to wrap my head around an interface that's all that's all kind of electronic right i mean it's it feels very much like just picking up another film camera (laughs) and and so just i don't have to think i don't have to think about um digital in a way that to me is really different than shooting film cameras and and i don't i don't mean that in a good way (laughs) to me it's a negative like when i was mainly shooting you know canon eos autofocus stuff i i had to use that camera completely i mean focusing everything is so different and it was a very it's like the whole experience is mediated in a different way that i never enjoyed doing i could do it because someone was paying me to do it which is mainly why i shot those cameras but i i never enjoyed doing it and i had my brain really had to work in a different way when i shot cameras like that so i i've said it before this is the only camera digital camera I will ever replace if and when someday it dies with, you know, another, another version of the same. Um, it's, it's the only digital camera I've ever really enjoyed using. So yeah, big, big, big kudos to Fuji for, for that camera. It's, it's 
it's something special and unique. So anyway, shot that a lot. Um, shot the six by nine folder a lot. Shot the rolly quite a bit. Uh, I shot the, I shot the Bessa L pano a, a little bit. Um, with a, I made a day trip to March Field, which is, I don't know if I just mentioned that, but it's, it's a there's a working military air base though there, but it's also one of the early, um, you know, air bases in the U.S. and and so they have a big display of uh, air aircraft on the ground. So they have like eighty different aircraft. I mean, like gigantic, you know, fighter bombers and stuff. So I I spent the day shooting that mainly with the um the the Bessa L with the pano mask in it and with the the Bessa actual six by nine camera. So that that was a that kind of a neat experience shooting those two side by side as well. Um but it worked pretty good. It 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 was a it was it was fun. I mean that was my thing I was hoping I would get to do while I was out there was shoot the Bessa more because I never seemed to find any time to do it. And I, I just wanted to take a camera that was relatively lightweight. Oh, it's a, it's not super lightweight camera, but it's compact, right? I mean, the thing is I thought about, all right, well, maybe I'll take a, a Roly with me. I'm like, no, I, I love the Roly and it doesn't really weigh any more than the Bessa, but it's just the shape of it. You know, if you've got a full bag full of camera stuff, it just really takes up most of that bag. Uh, by nature, but this thing just literally slid into the side of my my bag with no effort. Um, Johnny, so, have, it, so it was neat. Uh, have you ever tried the Percaro too? Um, I have not. No. Oh, you need to get one. You did try it. Novak's got mine. Maybe you can get it from from Mike when he's done shooting it. Sure, that would be it, cool. Yeah, those look nice. It's just they're so expensive. I I can't. It, Oh, I got my, I got mine for sixty dollars. Really? Because I I I've had yeah. an eye out for those for a while, but it's like it seems the best is turn up cheap, but the the Voigtlanders just seem to be it. It is my favorite pricier. travel folder because it's it's uh, the size of a thirty five millimeter and it's six by six. Oh, see, that wouldn't do it for me though. I I it's six by six folder. I'm like no, I oh, just but, if if oh, I'm gonna do that, I want a roll of flex. That <laughs> camera's magic, I tell you. I know. I just six to me six by six is. I want to do that. I don't want to do that with a. That's why I took this camera as a six by nine because I wanted yeah. to shoot. You know, so no, that's probably that's why I've shied away from that one. Is I just honestly I don't have any interest in shooting six by six. Somehow the, the the color scope power that's on that Percaro. No, I bet. Yeah, it, I bet the I bet the lens is beautiful. You know, because it's just getting the you know the square. You know, it it's so sharp and beautiful yeah it's, it's right like, absolutely there's something because i've got 15 cameras maybe 20 cameras with the color scope are and yeah. not, none of them resolve like that camera does that makes sense yeah that makes yeah. sense wow nice 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 I'm just gonna say anthony uh i can it's it's so easy to see why you were why you were friends with Carl, uh, and because uh, you just you just came in with that, and then the next thing goes, you've got to get one. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. I mean, he, Carl would have just been straight onto eBay or on his phone, wherever, wherever he was. So, uh, yeah. yeah, but they they did it. They made a six by nine folder. I right, I just can't remember the name they used for that one. I thought that's the one you were talking about originally no i mean i mean the Bessa one and the Bessa two were the six by nine folders oh that's right i'm thinking yeah. you know what i'm thinking of now i'm thinking of uh, not i'm thinking of agfa uh, the agfa made a really nice six by nine folder that along with the Bessa, is sort of like considered the yeah it's like one of the it's not the i can't remember which model it is i'll have to look it up perry perry wanted to ask me about the nagfa folder but it was one that i hadn't used Okay. Uh, let's see if I can come across his message to me real quick. Yeah. Um, I don't. I don't. Yeah, don't think the super it super it. isolate oh, was God. the one he was asking. Yeah, yeah that's that's the one I'm talking about too. Yeah, it's I haven't this, I haven't tried one yet. Yeah, it's basically it's basically the Agfa's version of the Bessa with the same kind of yeah. uh, feature set and a really good lens. But those 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 uh, tend to be pretty pricey, also. 
And then, and then Mike so. Ekman's been pushing me to try to find a uh, a Kodak Monitor 620, which he calls a uh, a folding medalist. Oh, okay. And uh, they're cheap, but they're pretty ratty. Apparently, they've got bellows problems. Yeah, uh, yeah. A lot of them are just like, you know, sieves. Yeah, I believe it. That that's what I like about the Voigtlander is it's actually built really well. Yeah. <laughs> it's got good bellows on it, and they tend to hold up pretty well. Absolutely. Yeah. So I've, I've actually, with all of my cameras, I've never had a Voigtlander with a leak in the bellows. Really? That's interesting. Yeah. Huh? Yeah, all of them. Oh, cool. Yeah. Um, other other than that, Simon, um, that's really been my whole week. I mean, I went to work on on Tuesday and left on Wednesday and got back late yesterday. So I I've just not been really around at all this week. Uh, so I've just been traveling. A lot of that was travel itself. Uh, two of those days were two full days of, tra- of travel. The first, the first going out there took seventeen hours. So, oh. yeah. So it's uh, you know it's been a it's been a been an odd week for me who does not travel very often. <laughs> but it was good. It was definitely good. This is where you hand over to me now, isn't it? <laughs> oh yeah, this is where we hand over to Simon. Simon how hey was Simon, your what's going on, Simon? How was your week? <laughs> well, funny you should ask. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, been been up to uh, a, a few things, um, um, but uh, I think I should start with um, what I mentioned that I was going to do uh, last week with the the Hasselblad SWC that's on loan to me from Jeremy North. Um, so I've I've now used it. Um, I've used it a couple of times actually, but primarily uh, Jeremy lent it to me so I could do some light painting in a confined space uh, as part of a workshop. And uh, so that happened on, when did that happen? Wednesday night uh, in the Peak District in the UK. And uh, yeah, it was a, it was a good evening. Um, and the camera was great. Or at least I think the camera was great, which you just don't really know, do you? Um, it's, it's also that thing about, and I've said it before, when people say, oh, what a wonderful lens something's got. Um, if you can look through the lens like with an SLR, then you've got a bit of an idea that, oh, that looks good. But uh, in the case of this one, it's effectively a scale focus camera. Um, there's, there's no mirror in there. It has a special body on it, which is effectively just there to attach the, the film back onto. Um, the lens is a Carl Zeiss 38mm f4 Biogon. Um, I think it's the equivalent of 21 millimeter and it was it was good for the the the, the space that we had um there's a clip on viewfind but in the end i don't think i actually used it because when you got a lens that wide it's you can just pretty much point it in the direction that you need it to go and you've with, with it being medium format as well you've got you know plenty of room to 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 crop if if something's not not quite right um so um yeah i i I really enjoyed using it it was the first shot that i took um i completely messed up um we we got lined up um and uh so there was i think there was about eight of us and and of course i was the only one with film um which um obviously made me feel a bit smug um but (laughs) who knows it might i might be i might pay for it with the with the photographs if if they don't actually work um but uh the, the first shot i completely messed up um because i thought i'd put the the camera into bulb mode but I, I, then i then changed the the aperture and this particular lens on this camera has got a linked um shutter speed to aperture setting so you turn one it, it adjusts the other and because i i'd actually initially set it up on bulb and then thought oh no i, I want to make a slightly smaller aperture so i turned it and that turned it onto one second so you know, the the guy that was running the workshop goes right is everybody ready yes okay now hit hit the shutter and i went click and and then i heard one second later i heard it shut and he goes right now we'll start with the wire wall <laughs> thinking oh no <laughs> <laughs> so completely missed it with my first shot but i was um and, and then at the end of it they were saying is everybody okay with that has everything worked and everybody's going yeah yeah well look at the photo oh that was amazing all this kind of stuff and i'm being very quiet um and then uh, one of one of the people uh, in the group where uh, uh, something wasn't quite right with their shot and um and and i said well yeah perhaps we should do it again so such and such can get can get a better shot 
<laughs> <Yeah. laughs> I, I didn't want to admit that me coming along with a film camera making me an expert, um, and I made the first mistake. <laughs> so, so uh, we, we the the shot was taken again. So ho hopefully that worked. Um, and uh, yeah, we had it was a it was a good evening. Um, and with the the camera having a bub bubble level on it um i pretty much put it put it in the right direction and just leveled it on the bubble bubble level um so uh, you know it's fingers crossed i used ektar 100 uh, iso ektar um and uh, most people were shooting at the same kind of settings and the same kind of isos and on digital so fingers crossed that's going to come out i won't know until um, early January was so that's the next time that we're going to do a C41 night at the Six Towns um, Darkroom Club. So uh, I'll be I'll either be very happy or quite disappointed uh, in early January. Uh, well, yeah. um, that wasn't actually the only time I used it as well this week because yesterday uh, I took a trip up to see a previous guest on the large format photography podcast uh, because he was donating a seven by five or five by seven enlarger to our darkroom club and on the way up to going to see him i, I drove past um a a place called uh, lady bower lady bower reservoir and uh, so it's an artificial lake uh, for drinking water um, but it's it's got a really unusual and pretty dramatic feature uh, for when the, the water gets too high. It has these raised holes uh, that that allow water to go over the top of it and then descend vertically downwards. So if there's not enough water in the, in the reservoir, you've just got these things that just stick up out of the water doing nothing. But if the reservoir um, height rises to the point where they'll overflow, um, then they go down into these reservoir, these, these plug holes as they call them locally, uh, because that's what they look like, except they're massive. They're, uh, I mean, I'm just think about how wide they are. I'm guessing they're about, Ooh, from from the intake to intake, they're probably about thirty feet. So I was gonna say about ten meters. It looks like. Yeah, yeah, I'd say that's that's it. That, there's there's me trying to trying to do it imperial, and and you and you're coming back with meters back to me. That, that, that's that's teamwork for you there. Um, and uh, yeah, and they make a heck of a noise as well. Um, but it's one of those those things that they they're very impressive. I mean, the actual shot itself, I'm not expecting that much. Um, and I took it with the SWC, and I took it with large format as well. But it was it was one of those things where I had time, and I was driving past the things, and I know that. I mean, there's a there's a Facebook group called Peak District Photography, and that's where um, people in the Peak District, which is where these things are, uh, put a lot of photographs on Facebook, and it's got to the point where oh not another shot of the plug hole yes we know what he does and and and, <laughs> and, and so on and so on and so on and uh yeah so it's a real cliche of a of a photograph uh, locally or in that area at least anyway um so i was driving past and i was thinking do i want to do that and, and i thought well it's going to be nice so i just turned the car around and and i did it and and it's it's just one of those things because it's i've i've got this shot before uh, or similar kind of shots. I don't think the shot I've taken is going to be as good as what I've managed before. Was the the, the conditions were nice, but they were they were nothing special. Um, but I just felt like I had to do it. It's a bit like when I was I used to do a lot of wildlife photography, and uh, and the, you get. Um, if you go out into the woods, it's quite often you'll come across uh, robins or European robins, as uh, to give them the, the the correct name. And they, it's not hard to get a robin shot in in the UK in in the woods, and they're quite they're relatively friendly, almost almost tame birds. I mean, they've, they've got a bit of a reputation of going after other birds and quite territorial. But as far as humans are concerned, they're yeah. they they're just lovely little things, and they just pop up everywhere, and it's and it's really easy to get a robin shot. Um, but yes, and whenever you see them, you still take pictures of them. You know, you know they're easy. There's no challenge, but they're beautiful. And and this this was this sort of got me thinking about this this plug hole shot. I'm like a sort of a apologetically uh, taking this shot that thousands of other people have done. I know that I put it onto Instagram and Twitter, and many people have never seen anything like it before. Which is, you know, it's great to see that kind of reaction. But I say locally, you know, you see these shots all the time, and it's it's that internal debate about you know do you do you take a shot because it's 
well, why, why, why do I want to take that shot, and why would I not take that shot? I just wonder if you guys have got any thoughts on that kind of situation. As as an as an outsider, somebody who's never seen photography, you know, from that region, I saw that shot. It was like this looks like a science fiction special effects shot. <laughs> you know, yeah. I mean, it's just got that sort of like coolness to it. That it's like it's like so unexpected that um, it's just fascinating. And, you know, so I certainly enjoyed seeing it. But, you know, as you talk about it, I think about like there are uh, German photographers, uh, Bernd and, and Hilla Becher, who did this uh, style of photography they call the, the new topographic or industrial yeah. facade photography, where they're taking photos of just like industrial buildings over and over and over again. And it's, you know, at one point, it's like, how many shots of a grain silo do you need? Uh but on the other hand, there's something to be said for photographing something repeatedly. And, uh, and I, you know, I don't think that you should shot. I mean, look at Mike Novak. Yeah. You know, I mean, we know Iowa city because of these, you know, on one hand you could say mundane photographs and I don't think Mike would shy away from that. Uh, but the, the repetition of it, uh, it brings a different dimension to it and makes you to think about it differently. And, uh, you know, I think that you shouldn't shy away from that. Yeah. No, I mean it. It, it it's I don't know. It's one of those things that it might be every. I get maybe everybody has shot it locally, but it doesn't mean everybody's seen it. You know, um, so yeah, why 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 not shoot it a different camera, different format? Um, you know, next time take a couple of dozen rubber duckies with you and just throw them out there, and <laughs> you could you could shoot the ducks going down the plug oil, and then you know. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> there was a there was a, a bit of controversy uh, a while back because somebody had got relatively close to uh, one of these plug holes in a boat. Um, oh, that could be a very bad day. Yeah, yeah, def- <laughs> definitely. But so I mean, the drop. Uh, I mean, I'll let you convert this to metric. It's probably around about forty, fifty, sixty feet straight down, and then. Oh. And then threw it through a tube, and then spat out the other side of a wall, probably or something like that. You know, if, if you're lucky. Um, it, it sounds like fun to some people, but I'm, I'm, I get the sneaky feeling you wouldn't make it. Um, I uh, probably, probably not. It's like Niagara Falls in a barrow. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. It right. Sounds like a good idea, but nobody makes it. Yeah, exactly. Um, but there was some- quick shut off the plug hole. He's gone down the plug hole. Shut it off. <laughs> <laughs> are, you, are you auditioning to, for Downton Abbey there, uh, John? Of course, yeah, yes. that's okay. Um, um, but there was a there was a photograph that somebody did in in this Peak District group. Um, they're, they're taking a, there was I don't know if it was their picture or not, but they um, they photoshopped a uh, an ocean going liner. <laughs> heading towards it. <laughs> it's a great one. So I mean, it does look like it looks like an SF, like a like a special effects shot. I mean, it it really does. Yeah. Well, I'll 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 put it into um, the uh, the our podcast Facebook group so people can uh, see what on earth uh, we're we're talking about there. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, but it's, I'm it's, glad you, I'm glad you shot it, Simon. That's that's good. You, it's good you shot it. Yeah, although whether the shots are going to work as well as the the fo- that's the other part. It's like that photograph is a phone shot of the camera in front of the the scene that it it was taken, and there's a there's a right. reasonable chance that that is actually better than the shot that I actually took with the, any of the cameras. <laughs> yeah. I mean that that that's is funny. the thing, isn't it? When it was, many of us, I'm I'm, I'm definitely one of those people that I'd, I'd like to take pictures of my equipment in front of the scene that's been taken and that they're they're that you know and sometimes i'll do that with a proper camera not just a phone and uh so i find sometimes you know the camera's more interesting than what i'm actually taking <laughs> right well, there you go there uh, you go anyway so uh is that it for me there are a few more things i'm going to uh, talk about a little bit later but um let's let's head over to gainesville um and see what anthony's been up to since he was last here in february sure well immediately yesterday uh you know florida you know it's still it was i mean we actually got down to 35 degrees this week uh and yesterday was the audubon society's great christmas bird count uh which I didn't realize until recently that, that that Gainesville, Florida, for this annual nationwide bird count, has the highest variety of species in one location. Uh, last year, they counted 175 different species of birds, uh, and this year it was 170. And I was invited to go along 
out onto this uh it's a state park it's a, a nature a nature preserve state park uh, about 21,000 acres of wilderness um and uh i've you know for years I, I live on this park and for years i've been photographing it when i have traditionally done wildlife photography uh for my digital camera i've got a pentax k1 uh which i think is really nice for landscape and i've and the reason i purchased it was because of its backward compatibility with every k mount lens uh so i've almost always ever shot it with uh you know classic takumar uh k mount uh, glass, uh, usually something in the 135 to 300 range. Um, and this year to be a contrarian, well, now everybody of course has upgraded their latest, uh, you know, Z Nikons with their, uh, you know, 600 millimeter lenses for the, for birding. Uh, I took my Voigtlander Bessel one and I took a, a pin FT with a 100 millimeter and I took my, my Knox 35 GT, um, and spent the day uh, bushwhacking through some very crazy terrain, uh, a bluff overlooking this massive preserve uh, marsh lake uh, where I think they counted uh, like 2,500 sandhill cranes and uh, oh, you know, wow. hundreds, of, hundreds and hundreds of, 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 of songbirds like, you know, uh, warblers and uh, sparrows i actually have an area called sparrow alley we spent several hours just owling like doing owl calls and seeing if we could get responses uh oh. but for me it was it was you know an exercise in using the the best of, uh, the best of one uh to try to just more set the scene you know sort of get a sense of the landscape that these birds are in because you know i'm not going to be getting close-ups and we've got plenty of robins and i think we counted uh like 350 robins yesterday uh, but they're not going to get close enough for me to shoot with that, with that best of one. Uh, but you get the sense of this environment with this incredible biodiversity. You know, I think that that's where those cameras really excel is that the six by nine, you get a sense of that landscape that is uh, uh, just so different than what I can get with the K one. Uh, I, I love shooting it. Johnny, for your best, do you have the, uh, the insert to be able to shoot six, four, five? I do not know. <laughs> Mine doesn't <laughs> either. Those are hard to come by. <laughs> you know, my camera, it's one of those, uh, like, Doctor Who cameras. Look like it came out of the, the TARDIS, uh, where it just literally, it literally looks like I just unboxed it last week, including wow. the case. So, you know, the velvet on the case is just perfectly plush, and uh, every stitch is in place. And the camera itself, it, it's just like, I don't think it had ever been used. Uh, but, of course, it didn't have the insert. Yeah, those, those are, oh, yeah, 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 those are hard to come by. <laughs> well, the, the irony is, is that I've got a, a 1938 Bessa uh, that has the insert. Uh, okay. And it's great because you pop it in and it, it, it has like a, a lever where it reads the insert and opens up the different set of red windows. Yeah. Uh, automatically, which is really nice. And Yeah, that's cool. Uh, but the, the Vascar lens on the 1938 just doesn't, you know, it's, it's just kind of, it lacks the definition that you get out of the vessel one okay yeah uh, but man i i do love shooting that camera both of them actually but I, the, the vessel one's just uh, it's such a solid camera yep uh, well, and then of course definitely. shooting the uh uh the pin ft with the 100 which on the pin ft that's it felt more like a 200 you know or 150 plus yeah it's it right it, it, it well it really is right i mean it's like a 150 so yeah <clears throat> that's a nice lens i really yeah. like that one and uh so i'm i i i of course need to shoot more on that roll to be able to uh to develop it <laughs> right right but uh and then the minox i had the minox loaded up with uh, uh some uh i think i was shooting um velvia 50 with that uh just to get some color uh, cool but it's been a yeah it's been a sort of a crazy week of shooting with as many different cameras as possible uh um went down to a, a massive uh hot rod show in daytona beach and these people take their hot rods very seriously i think there were over five thousand cars uh and i took the the contacts 2a and i took a nikon or not like I take a nikon f and then i shot uh the Leica M3, and I shot my Rolly 35. 
Uh, and it was a blast just walking around these these crazy hot rod enthusiasts. And between the people in the cars, it was, a, it was what you might call the target rich environment. And then other than that, I've been collaborating a bit with Mike Ekman on his site. And Mike's got me shooting all sorts of fun uh, cameras that might otherwise not really make it into rotation for me uh, because we need, uh, you know, he needs photos for his, his reviews. And so I've become a bit of a sort of an ad hoc uh, uh, spec photographer for him. So, you know, he'll send me a message saying, I need, I need shots from the Mercury 2 CX. What do you have? <laughs> <laughs> and that's, that's it's that's really excellent. got me chasing some cameras that I wouldn't have thought so much about otherwise. Like I, I, I absolutely fell in love with shooting the Kodak Sig Sigma 35, uh, which is mid fifties, maybe 51 through 55, 56. And it has that art deco design that you would see on the Chevron and a bit of the you know, design cues from the metalist, but it's almost as small, if not smaller than a Voigtlander Vito B. And it's got an Ektar lens and, you know, it's, it's a bit of a, you could say it's a bit of a crude camera. You know, it's not a very sophisticated camera, but it's, it's just a joy to shoot and the, and the quality of the shots I've been getting off of it. I'm always surprised. Yeah. And uh, other than that, uh, you had Cheyenne on the show two weeks ago. Uh, and he had been talking about his love for the Biotar and the M42 version of the Biotar. And I was looking through Facebook groups and found this incredibly out of focus photograph uh, from Boo Boo's Discount Emporium in Bunnell, Florida, that just said antique camera, $60 or $70. And I'm looking at it and it's like, that's Cheyenne's Biotar on an exact blue. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I text message Boo Boo and I'm like, I will be there momentarily. Don't sell that camera. And I don't think I really needed to do that because I don't think anybody had actually been in Boo Boo's Discount Emporium looking for a camera in <laughs> 20 or 30 years. And I drive to this little town called Bunnell, Florida, uh, which I later find out has the highest per capita crime rate of any city in the United States. <laughs> uh, average. So are there like 20 people there and they're just robbing each other all day long? That would be it's really kind of, cool. It's kind of like it's, it's on the way to Daytona Beach and it's, <laughs> it's primarily – uh, gun shops and biker bars. <laughs> I don't see the problem here. Why? Why would they have a crime problem? <laughs> <You would> guess. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and I go in and, and and I'm I'm sure I was the only customer in Boo Boo's Discount Emporium, and and Boo Boo comes running out. She was very excited. She was wearing an elf outfit, and uh, <laughs> oh my god, you know, it's Christmas time, and and the and, and the, the, this place is just like it's like an it's like a a failed. 7-Eleven that has been turned into a junk shop and there's a glass shelf glass case up by the front and it's completely stuffed with knickknacks and junk and very at the very bottom I walk in I'm like well, holy crap that's that's an exact two and that's the black biotar 5.8 17 blade lens that Cheyenne was talking about and you know you never expect an exacta to work and especially not <laughs> exactly one especially not one from Boo Boo's discount emporium <laughs> and, <laughs> and she pulls it out and I, you know, it's got the crazy, you know, left hand wind and I'm like, and, and, and this one is, is opposed to the later Varex where it had the, uh, um, like the, 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 the weird trigger, the, the shutter release that's shuttered by the attachment that's on the lens. This has this like mushroom soft release button over the, uh, the button. And I click it and it goes, tick. Uh, shouldn't have happened. Zzzz, dead on every speed. Wow. And it's completely in cover, in, encased in dust. And I, and I take the lens off and uh, she couldn't believe that I actually knew what it was. And of course, as soon as I showed an interest, she's pulling out every dirty camera that she had in the discount emporium and mostly, you know, plastic Kodak cameras from the sixties. Uh, and I'm like, no, this is the one I'm kind of interested in. And uh, I looked through the lens and there, there are some cleaning marks on it. It did look, you know, I've had certainly had worse lenses and I was like, look, this thing's, you know, it's been sitting here and it's really filthy and I'm going to have to spend some time working on it. What do you think about 60 bucks? And she couldn't have jumped on it fast enough. You know, she was not going to let me out of there without that camera in my hands. Uh, <laughs> 
and shockingly it works perfectly fine i've been shooting the heck out of it and just absolutely enjoying it and and, and just to be contrary i put the the lens on my 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 exa one uh which is sort of like the the turbant of cameras <laughs> <laughs> and <laughs> And I probably had more compliments on the portraits that I took using the the Biotar on the on the on the EXA than than it, most cameras I've shot in the last six months. So I'm just it really is a spectacular lens, uh, and I'm very lucky now that I, I was able to to get get it. On, and I didn't realize there were I mean somebody pointed out that they only made like twelve thousand of these ex, these exacta twos. Uh, I'm just, so just I'm very lucky to have one that's in perfect working condition. I'm, I'm just just thinking. I think I think we need to rebrand uh, cleaning marks to character marks. <laughs> <laughs> character marks. I mean, maybe you could tell that there were cleaning marks on it because I mean it's noticeable. I mean, this is not a lens that's been babied, uh, and who knows? Last time this camera was used. I mean, the one thing about Florida is we get a lot of retirees down here uh, that you know bring their belongings with them and then they sort of get parsed out as they realize they don't need everything. So we have these crazy finds like this that show up in non-traditional, you know, places like, you know, Facebook groups and, and Craigslist. Um, of course we also have, uh, just we're a wash in Canon AE ones where everybody thinks they're worth $500. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but the, but occasionally you'll find something like this, and it was just such a lovely find. And it is, a, it, you know, I got to give it to Cheyenne. This lens is really something else. Yeah, yeah, I'm a big big fan of Biotars um, and and the Helios ca- uh, lenses as well, for that matter. Um, yeah, but that's a, yeah, it did look particularly nice that one. It, how many blades is it again? Is it? I think it's seventeen. Seventeen, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean that's that's going some as well. With it being on the quite a small. Lens, which I mean, you get you get these high numbers on the on the longer focal lens, but that's that's good going, isn't it, for for fifty eight mil? Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. And then the, the other really crazy lens that I picked up was the uh, the Voigtlander Super Dynarex three fifty. Uh, oh yeah, I remember you, you posted about this a while ago. It is <laughs> the most idiosyncratic lens I think I've ever shot. Uh, and again, I got lucky. I got a pristine copy. Um, it came attached to a, an ultramatic that the the, uh, um, the prism's fairly degraded. It's desilvered, uh, but I popped it onto my super besomatic, <laughs> and the lens is just like the minimum focal distance on it is is, is ninety feet. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and and people are wondering, well, why is it so mint? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> why does it look unused? But but what's just as crazy is. If you're looking at the focusing scale, you still need to do critical focus at at, at twelve hundred feet. Because <laughs> <laughs> right. I was I was I was I was actually trying to shoot some horses that were a half mile away and realized that at infinity they were out of focus. Yeah. Wow. And uh, you know, it's just like it's it's a very <laughs> of course foolishly I took it out to try to take bird shots with it. Uh, <laughs> And basically, I had to set like a focus on a particular place and wait for a bird to land there. Yeah, because uh, you're not going to because it's just so. I mean, the the focus throw on that thing is insane, and it's it's like so granulated and 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 it's heavy. And and of course, with the Bessomatic, you've got like the weird focusing on the left hand side on the knob, and you're trying to hold this, and the, the thing weighs, you know, two kilograms and four pounds. And uh, it, yeah, it's just it's, a, it's an awkward lens, but talk about you know compression of of of, of field of view. Um, you know, I shot across the the graveyard where Carl and I used to go to test lenses, and you know, so I was focusing at something that was about a hundred feet away, and realized that um, it compressed everything for about the next one hundred yards into one small slice of the of the the field of view. It literally, it looked like a, a gravestone or a marker or a statue that was like yards away. It looked like it was three feet away from the yeah. the, the, the stone that was that was a hundred feet away from me. Wow! Uh, so complete. I don't know what this lens was used for. I mean, maybe it was for, you know, observation on the Berlin Wall, where it would be on a, you know, it would have been on a, 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 a like a fixed mount, and I just, I just don't know who and why because it couldn't use it for sports. 
It's, it's, it's a crazy lens. It's beautiful, but crazy. Wow. Yeah, I just wonder if it was for low light and designed to be shot wide open, and and then you've got you know from a distance and with the, with that fine focus to be able to still isolate the subject. But uh, no, that doesn't make much sense, does it? No, I just like. I, I mean, I'm assuming it was a landscape. You know, maybe you're like shooting, you know, the Alps. You know, you're taking yeah. it to the, your trip to the Matterhorn. Right. Uh, uh, is that from the Pyrenees? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it's it's yeah, it's a, it's a it's a bonkers lens, and of course because it's you know Voigtlander, you know, from that same period as like the Ultron and the and the Septon, it's beautifully made. And at the time, Cheyenne sent me the uh, the dealer price list. It was the most expensive lens that the Voigtlander made for the uh, for the uh, um, Ultramatic. Wow, I mean, and and now of course the uh, uh, there's like a forty millimeter lens that that if you can find one, they're like fifteen hundred dollars, and and this one I picked up for ninety bucks. They did the did the is it the Septon for that that camera as well? Is it? Yeah, the Septon's for that camera as well. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's nice. That's a nice lens. I've not never managed, never quite managed to get my hands on on to that lens. I'd love to though. Well, but, I ended up picking one up for fairly cheap, but of course it was cheap because when it showed up, it had massive uh, balsam separation. Hmm. Uh, though, although you can tell by looking at it, you know, at an an oblique angle, it, I'm yet to see any real influence of it in the shots that I've taken with it, actually using the, the lens. Uh, you know, it, it looks worse than it is as far as the usability of the lens. I'm sure it it hammered its uh, resale value, but yeah. as a user, it's a, it's perfectly fine. Yeah. yeah. Right. Well, um, thanks for bringing us up to date there. And I sure. think uh, let's let's stay in Gainesville, Florida, uh, because we've we've there's a you know we've we've got some news. I um, think <laughs> we don't have news very often, but there is some news at the moment, and it's almost well, it's still current for the next two days at least. And that is there was a an auction sale of some of Carl's uh, prints. Um, I think there's is it nine prints? I think for sale. I, I think, think it's seven oh. seven prints and seven paintings. Yeah, that's it. Or is it? Uh, or actually, no, oh, I think there's twelve. Yeah, it's six and six. Yeah, that's it. So. Uh, um, yeah, so there are 12 uh, paintings and photos uh, that have been auctioned off for the Coal Haven's excellent, Excellence Endowment. Um, and, uh, and there's two days left on that. And what we'll do, we'll put a link into, uh, into the podcast notes. But if anybody wants to uh, take a look at these, um, I think if you... If you type in Carl Haven's Carl Haven's auction, then that's one way you will actually be able to navigate through to to this. But it was quite easy for me to find that. Um, but the website that it's on is uh, www.32auctions.com, and I imagine you can just type in Carl Haven's and find uh, find some more de details there. And uh, these are photographs largely of uh, Florida and uh, some of Carl's abstract paintings because uh, Carl was of very much, you know, Carl did so many things, and um, and it always always gets me that photography w was a secondary hobby uh, to his painting. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, it, it, it shocked me one day when we were we were walking around taking photographs out of this this graveyard that we would shoot at, and uh, he was talking about how he was feeling a little bit frustrated with photography, or he was bummed about a lens that didn't perform the way that he wanted, and he talked about how he had kind of blown off steam by painting, and I had no idea. Uh, that that was actually, I think he was painting before he was working with classic lenses. Yeah. Oh, definitely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. That brought so much joy to him to, to be able to just, you know, pull out his, his, his palette and his, his canvas and, uh, and work out these paintings. And he, you know, he kind of approached them with the same sort of, of, of like scientific approach that he did to everything where he was like, you know, playing with colors and playing with abstractions and, and playing with different sort of theoretical ideas that he had uh, and working them out in paint. And, you know, they're, they're really delightful to, to see in person because yeah. uh, they're very, the paint's very thick. There's a very tactile sense to the paintings that, that don't really show up in the reproductions. No, I can imagine. Uh, yeah. but so, I mean, Anthony, uh, perhaps, I mean, you know a little bit about this, um, 
this this excellence fund. Um, I just wonder if you can just give a little bit of an outline as to uh, what it's about. Sure. Carl was the the director of the University of Florida Sea Grant, which was a uh, like a special institute to study uh, the coastal environments around Florida. And I mean, it, it's hard to convey the stature that that Carl had in the in the community as far as the importance of his research for protecting Florida. Uh, and he, you know, studied uh, coastal environments like oyster hatch- hatcheries and and oyster grounds, and he studied the, the the algae blooms that were occurring around the state of Florida that have been just so detrimental to the environment. And uh, they've created this endowment to allow grad students to continue the work that that Carl had initiated. And so they're creating this endowment fund to fund specific projects related to. Uh, his different areas of expertise, and it'll make sure that that Carl's you know, areas of interest and his focus uh, will continue through this this endowment. Uh, you know, in the University of Florida, it's a, this is a major program. I didn't realize how important this this was within the uh, the scope of the university until until later. And it's it's massive, and and this is a, this is a very uh, this will be used to attract uh, some of the best grad students in these areas of of study. Uh, to come here and continue Carl's work. It's just, it's a fascinating project. Yeah. And uh, one of the, uh, one of the links that um, if anybody just does, does do some search and we'll, we'll put all the links up there, but there's uh, there's a, a, there's a photograph of, of Carl um, in the Everglades somewhere um, uh, with, with two cameras taking a photograph and uh, <laughs> around his neck, he's got his, his Sony and uh, his, Canon 50 mil 1.4 LTM, which uh, uh, is 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 now with me. Um, but the uh, the camera he's using, he's using the Kodak Medalist, and you know something about that, don't you, Anthony? Yeah, that was I. It was I was always trying to put fun cameras in Carl's hands, and sometimes he would just look at him and just shake his head like, "No, no, I'm not going to, no, no." Like the Vitessa, I really tried to get him to shoot with the Vitessa L, and he just looked at it as like, "No." <laughs> <laughs> but the medalist, he was just—he loved that camera, and he borrowed it every chance that he could. And so I'd roll up six twenty for him and hand it to him, and then he'd give it back, and I'd process it and scan it. And he just—he really enjoyed shooting with that camera. And I, and I think part of it is, of course, that his interest in the landscapes. That's such a great camera. Those six by nine negatives, they just, the, you know, the way that they render the landscape, they they really are special. And and he he appreciated that. Yeah, yeah. No, that's that, that's that's lovely to see. Uh, and one of the one of the photographs that uh, is is printed there is uh, because when you go onto the site, you can see the details of how of of the cameras and uh, lenses that Carl had used to take those, and, and not all of them are classic lenses, uh, but there's uh, there's there's one of them there which I think is probably one of the last ones that was taken, and that was uh, taken with the uh, the Voigtlander um, forty mil uh, knocked on that uh, that 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 Johnny uh, now now has. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's, I think that was the last shot I remember him posting. And then, yeah. you know, there, yeah. there's also a shot of, of Lake Okeechobee. Uh, I believe it's a digital, digital shot. But, uh, you know, for Carl, this was the cornerstone of his academic research, was uh, looking at the way that the, the Lake Okeechobee is contributing to the algae blooms that occur around Florida. And I believe he was presenting about Lake Okeechobee that last weekend that he was away at a conference. And uh, so it's a, you know this was one that was near and dear to his heart. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So those, uh, those links are going to be out there. Um, so if you want to take a look and you've got till Wednesday, the 18th, um, of this month, if any of those are of interest to you, and if you do buy any of those, then the, the funds raised are going to go to a very good cause. So, uh, so at least take a look at them. Yeah. Right. Okay. Um, let's move on because we have a few emails to go through. Um, so Johnny, are you up for a few emails? I am. I can do those. Uh, I think I have them queued up right here. Okay. Email time. Uh, first email. Let's see. What order are we going in actually? Do I have them in the right order? I do have them in the right order. I think. Well, we'll find out. Uh, Philip Lenrick writes us on December 10th. His subject is humor for Johnny. 
and uh, he sends a link, and it is a link to a YouTube video, and it is the guy who overpronounces foreign words from the College Humor uh, page on YouTube. So check check that out. We'll put that. We'll put the link in. I I think this is pretty much exactly what I was. It it is. It is, and uh, <laughs> and it, it it sort of make it, it just shows what a nonsense it is to actually say things in the. <laughs> the correct way i mean it's still it's still going to be a gray area because there are going to be some things that you know you you probably should make a bit of an effort to make it sound vaguely close to uh to, to the original uh, right. but the the it's it's a funny video and and it's a, a guy well it's three guys in a in a restaurant and and one guy is insisting on ordering his food in <laughs> the, the native way uh, right. whether that be french german Italian, what, what, whatever it is, it's, it's you know, it's heavily, heavily accented, and in he's in trying to make it sound exactly uh, like somebody uh, would say it in, in the native country, in the native language, and it's just, it's just ridiculous, it's utterly ridiculous. Right, which uh, is, I, I, I've been out to dinner with that person before. I was in a yeah. uh, restaurant with somebody who had just been in Italy, and they made a, a, a very sharp point of correcting my pronunciation with everything I ordered with the with the waiter. And the poor waiter just had to stand there. And <laughs> yeah. He knew what I was ordering. You know, he did not need help. <laughs> but the, that's what's so funny. It's like it doesn't matter if you turn it up to eleven or not. It still sounds silly because if you only do the accent a little bit, it just sounds like you don't know what you're trying, what to, what you're trying to say. And then if you do it all the way, it just sounds r- ridiculous. So, so where where do we sa- where do we stand on holai? <laughs> <laughs> Where's that? Where, where are we going with that one? What is the Classic Lenses podcast correct uh, pronunciation for that? We can say it however we want. That's the correct pronunciation. Okay. Yeah, we're, we're also, we also butcher Voigtlander. Yeah, come um, on. Yeah, right. And those those Pentax lenses from the seventies, from the in sixties, I should say. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so that that was uh, that's 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 a funny one, uh, Philip. So th- thanks for sending that in, and uh, um, and those listening, if you get a chance, uh, just just uh, have a listen yourself. Because the the link will be there. Yep, thanks very much for that, Philip. Um, okay, we're going to move on to Doug Moore, who also wrote us on December tenth, and he wrote back about Monday's podcast. Uh, just finished. With Monday's episode, I'm totally on board. If you wish to change podcast name to F*** Trump Podcast or F*** Xi Jinping Podcast, we cannot bury our heads in the sand. All of you are doing a great job, Doug Moore. Thank you, Doug. My sentiments exactly. (laughs) You know, we didn't talk about the the election this week in the UK, but I guess (laughs) we can stick our heads in the sand about that one. Yeah, I'm quite happy to do that. (laughs) <laughs> okay, um, on to December 12th from our old buddy, Jay Bowie. Jay Bowie from Mississippi. Um, subject, my crappy cameras from December 10th show. I'm in total agreement with you guys, with the exception of the Voigtlander. The Voigtlander's winding system is fun to use and is a real conversation starter. So without spending all of my kids' inheritance, what camera and lens combination would you recommend so I can enjoy the thrill and joy of using Joy of the Rangefinder World? Jay Bowie, pronounced B-O-O-E-E, like the Bowie knife. Jay Bowie, <laughs> from Northern... Yeah, but he's from northern Mississippi. Yeah, but he's got the boo e. So boo e. Yeah. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Did you so, that? Bit? All right. I, I pronounce his it, I, that 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 pronunciation again goes up to our previous point about trying to pronounce the things about in the the dialect of the place where they're from that that sound does not come out of my mouth i'm from chicago <laughs> i just i south. can't make that sound <laughs> booey i just can't make that it, it doesn't sound right booey like, booey that's easy isn't it am i doing it right booey yeah, yes yeah but it does look like bowie knife so yeah so there you go. R- right bowie but exactly. of course over, over here you get some people will call like like david bowie um, we'll call him Bowie. Yeah. So that, that's another well, that way would, of saying that. That would be my perno- my point is that nobody pronounces it Bowie. But Jay in, does, and it's his name. Well, yeah, because Jay's from Mississippi. 
Okay. That's my point. I can't do that because I'm from, it just doesn't sound, it sounds like I'm trying to do, he's pronouncing it with a Southern accent is the, is the point. Hmm. So that word spelled B O W I E is just never pronounced Bowie. Unless you're from Mississippi. Yeah. It just isn't pronounced that way because it, because it, it's, it's yeah. Anyway. Yeah. It's just so, like, so, so I don't have that email in front of me. Is that the, it was even asking about range finders. What was the question? I think that was where it started. Um, and, <laughs> <laughs> we, we don't, we don't yeah. care about that. We're just yeah. talking about, we're just talking about pronunciations now. <laughs> cause I, cause I was going to get a plug in for one of my favorite sort of off brand range finders. Uh, it's actually the first one that I wrote about with Mike Ekman and that's the Minolta super a, which is really undervalued for what you get. Uh, if you can find a, a good, clean Super A, it should be a fraction of what you would pay for. Uh, I think I paid less for my Minolta Super A with the with the uh, uh, Super Rucker uh, 1.7 lens than I would have had to have paid for a replacement take-up spool for my M3. And it's just it's a fantastic 15, 19, late 1950s, early 60s rangefinder to work with. It gives you like 90% of, of an M3 for... A, a tenth of the price. So, how, how's the viewfinder experience on that? Because that was that was one of the areas that um, it's, it's fantastic. Yeah. Okay. It's 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 it's, it's got to be close to coverage of what you get on an M3. So that's the Minolta Super A. Yeah. There you go. All right. Official recommendation. Yeah. It's it's, Thank tru- you. it's it's truly a sleeper. You know, it's one most people don't even know that it exists. The problem with it is that uh, it was only manufactured for like two years. And they had their own, it's its its, it's, its own um, mounting system. And so the lenses for that don't work on any other Minolta camera. Uh, and the, the lenses are fantastic if you can find them, but they're hard to find. You know, usually it'll, they, they made, I think, three iterations of the 50. Uh, and they're all fantastic. Like, you know, we've, uh, Mike's got, Mike Heckman's got one version. I've got the other. And, you know, to, sit, to see the images side by side, you'd be hard pressed to tell, uh, which one was the the f two and which one was the one seven um, but uh the other lenses uh, you know they, they can be anywhere from fifty dollars to thousands of dollars because uh, it's such a, a you know kind of a apparently you can adapt the the lenses for digital and the, and they've been sort of absorbed into that uh, mess yeah. and, and you just can't get them for the prices that you would expect to be able to find them for for a camera that's just not that popular. Uh, but it's a, it's a real sleeper camera for somebody that wants to get into range finders, but doesn't want to like you know, splash down for, you know, a Leica or a Contax or. I, I, I can see one on eBay at the moment and it's in the States as well. And it's, uh, it has dust and moderate haze, um, but it's got a 50, 50 F S 50 F two super rocker on it. And uh, it's a nice looking camera. Though. I've never seen one before. I think oh, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a real pleasure to shoot. You know, I mean, like I said, it's, uh, it's like to me, it's like eighty percent of an M3 uh, for f- just a fraction of the price. Yeah. Mm, yeah. Good one. <sighs> Thank you, Jay Bowie. <laughs> Thank you. Seriously, thank you. Okay, uh, Bill. How do we pronounce this one? <laughs> <laughs> you're 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 now the arbiter of uh, pronunciations, Johnny. So oh uh, no, this is just going to come out wrong when I try to say <laughs> this word. And oh, we need somebody on who can speak Italian. Say, yeah, I was going to say, say it like a native, and then I'm sure it'll come out better. <laughs> is this Peter? Yeah, yes. yeah. I, I would say Cosiani. Thank you. That sounds Peter good. Co- Peter Cosiani. Tell it right in and tell us if we're wrong, Peter. Uh, Peter Cosiani uh, writes uh, technical and film confusion. Oh boy, buckle up, folks! This is going to be a ride. <laughs> it, there's a couple. There's a few paragraphs here, so we're gonna we're gonna go right through it. Hello, Simon, Johnny, and Perry. Firstly, thank you for the fantastic entertainment, superb knowledge, and the tremendous hit on my finances. I discovered I could adapt vintage lenses to my APS-C Sony body in December last year. Purchased my first lens in January this year, a Vivitar 24 millimeter lens. Uh, and first came across the podcast the week Perry's Hong Kong scene episode went to air. Over the last 11 months, so much has changed. 
I look back through my Instagram feed and see that probably nine out of 10 photos taken with my vintage lens in the few, few months of this year were all taken wide open and mostly of flowers. I don't even like many of the photos I took, I, I took now that I look back. Uh, fast forward to the last few months, and I mostly shoot at f8 or f11, and I am vastly more interested in street and urban photography. One lens has grown to 42 lenses, all our SLR lenses, and I have spent <laughs> I have spent no more than the equivalent of about 180 US dollars for any one lens, and often much less than that. Uh, I'm still in the period where buying and trying lots of lenses is super exciting. In about June, I decided that I should purchase film bodies to use my collection of Minolta, Pentax K, and Konica lenses with. Knowing nothing about film bodies, I tended to go for bodies that had aperture priority modes, Pentax, Minolta, and shutter priority mode, Konica, and did lots of reading and watching of YouTube clips. I like to think my photography style and the way I go about photography has evolved as the podcast has evolved as well. My question is, how do I go about choosing what film to use? I understand that this is a very subjective topic, uh, but where do I even start as a complete beginner in film photography? With a 12-month-old son, I have neither the time or space to learn how to develop my own film. Getting film developed is expensive. Uh, are there some go-to films that you regularly use? Are there films that you would recommend based on lighting conditions? Could you suggest some films ranging from truly budget-friendly to more expensive, both color and black and white? Uh, are there any resources online you recommend I read or watch? Again, I know film type is very subjective, but some tips for th- for three photography gurus like yourselves would be greatly appreciated. Keep up the good work. Stay safe, Perry. Peter Cochiani. Is that right? Cochiani, Melbourne, Australia. So he's from Australia. Wow. Yeah. Very good. Uh, well, this is a big meaty topic. It is. Um, I've, I've yeah. got ideas. Yeah, I do, I do too. I mean, I, I'll just quickly, my thought is if you're not going to develop it yourself and it's black and white film, it almost doesn't matter because you're going to have no control over it. So if it's black and white and you're not going to develop it yourself and you're going to lab process it, I would actually recommend XP2 because it's, I think for a black and white going through lab chemistry, since it just goes through C41, I think it, I think the results come out really good color. Yeah. It's really subjective. So you see, I, if he can find some place that can develop black and white, I would, I would go with something like like Trix that you can r- really push or pull depending on what you want. Like you can, you, you've got a lot of latitude for uh, different lighting conditions and different styles. Like you can, like you know, the, the Trix can be kind of like a uh, a shape shifter, and it gives you the chance to mimic several different kinds of films. Like I almost always pull my Trix. Yeah. And and really love the look that I get out of it, uh, but I've seen people push it to thirty two hundred and still get great results on it. Yeah, uh, sure. so it's it's a sort of film that's not that expensive uh, for now. And uh, yeah, and Just labs wait, are, wait two weeks, <laughs> and, and, and labs are very comfortable working with it. So as long as they can do simple pulling or pushing, uh, it's a it's it's like one film that gives you a lot of uh, a lot of different opportunities to to play around. Yeah, it. I, I, see that would be my suggestion as well. It's just I I I just don't I don't know. I I think it's really really highly unusual to find a lab that does decent black and white. Yeah. Uh, because there are just not that many labs left, and if they're going to do your black and white, they're going to put it through the standard stock Fuji, you know, one size fits all chemistry most likely. Yeah. Um, and it just, it, you, you almost always get flat looking images yeah. no matter what you do, because it's just, it's mini lab processing. And then they, and then they make prints and the prints look flat because they're, they're just trying to get a usable image. So I, it's, to me, it's really hard to do 
stuff creatively with black and white if you're not processing it yourself. And also, honestly, I think it's the more expensive route. I think if you're yeah. doing black and white and your lab developing it, it's par- pretty much the most expensive way to shoot black and white film. So I don't know. I mean, that would be my... I would make the same suggestion as Anthony if you're doing it yourself, but it's to me the lab thing is a real wild card because you just don't know how they're developing it. You don't know if they can even accommodate push pull processing and it's, it's hard to learn. And we did, we talked about those Carl a lot. It's hard to learn anything shooting black and white. If you're not doing the processing part, cause it really has so much yeah, impact not, on the final not, look of the image. I, I could not convince Carl to develop at home. I know. And I tried so hard. And, yeah. <laughs> and it, it's like, you know, one of the things that I do at my, at, you know, I run this, this, this coffee shop, that we, I teach a, a monthly caffeinol workshop and I'm a real believer in caffeinol because it's a very forgiving developing process. You know, it, it's not as, you know, you can, you can, uh, you can really with one set development time, uh, it can take a wide array of, of exposure, uh, yeah. pushing and pulling and be pretty much spot on. Um, it's very forgiving. And, you know, with that, the only chemical you need to buy is, is fix. Because uh, yeah. you can wash with water with caffeinol very easily, you know, for, for the stop. And uh, so your, your, your outlay to develop at home is really just, just tanks, you know. And, and, yeah. and so one of my other suggestions about this is of, of all of the different things that I have found used, developing gear is the cheapest, yeah. Like you go to a, you go to a photo swap meet or you know photo gear swap meet. There's several that are local to us. I've found development tanks for pennies every time. Like I don't think I've spent more than two dollars on development tanks for Peterson for Patterson tanks or for for metal tanks. Uh, and and it's the same with with bulk loaders. Uh, I think I've got nine loaded bulk loaders right now. Uh, four of which came with film in them i got um i got 100 feet of of, of pervia 400 and 100 feet of velvia 50 for three dollars with the bulk loader and you know it just gives you a chance to experiment with different films very you know affordably yeah i mean it, yeah. No, knowing that he is a 12 month old son makes me yeah yeah. <laughs> I mean, I don't do bulk loading because I don't have the time for it. And I don't think he, if he's got a 12 month old son, he's probably, I mean, it's a good thought. And I, 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 I think this is the, the big challenge here with film photography is it's time and money. And you got to figure out which, which one you have more the of. most of, and maybe you don't have a lot of either one, but if it's, you know, if you have more money than time or more time than money, it can really help your decision making process. But so you know, with, with book loading, I mean, I got, I got some really fascinating films that I've got going right yeah. now. Like I, I've got the, the Oro pan, uh, 100 from like 1989. Uh, it's a beautiful film. And yeah. And I just ordered, I just, I just found a, a very cheap auction sale for, uh, 400 feet of Kodak five, two, two, zero, which is also known as XT pan. Is that, have you ever played with that Johnny? Uh, five, two, two, zero. I don't think so. Yeah. No. So it was the, it was released from like 1964 till 19, the mid seventies. And it was the, uh, the, you know, if double X is the, uh, cinematic, you know, 200 ISO film, uh, this was designed to be, uh, the cinematic version of Panatomic X. So oh, okay. it's, it's 25 ISO super fine grained. It was to allow cinematographers to be able to shoot like second unit outside without having to use uh, neutral density filters. Yeah. And it was specifically in their spec sheet designed for, um, for rear projection. So, you know how in the old uh, motion pictures, you'd have like a guy driving in a car, but they wouldn't actually be in a car. They would just be in a cutout of a car in a soundstage and there'd be a right. scene behind them that projected. So uh, 5220 was that. It was designed to be the uh, the film that was so fine grained that it could be rephotographed and appear to be a background that was uh, somewhat seamless. Um, so I'm excited to play with it. It's also designed to be developed in uh, D96, which is a developer that that Cinestill has just released commercially. I think it's one of the first times that the D96 has been available to uh, you know home developers. I am absolutely in love with working with that developer. Uh, you know, it works great with Double X. It changes the way the Double X 
you know, develops completely for me. And, uh, but it also works with FOMA 100 and, uh, you know, and it works with all of the, uh, the Orvo films, the, like the, 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 uh, the re-releases from, uh, from Lomo, of the, the Potsdam and the Kino. Uh, it just, it gives it that look of like a Vim Vendors film from like 1975. Mm. Uh, and it's super easy to work with. Uh, so the, you know, something like the, the D 96 is great because it's a, it's just stock solution. It's not a one shot. So, uh, you know, one $4 pack of D 96 is good. They say it's good for a uh, hundred foot roll of film. Uh, and I've, it, and, and it uses a special rapid fix. That's only, it's a one minute fix. So, uh, the standard development time on D 96 with double X is like six minutes and 30 seconds. Hmm. And so you can be start to finish eight minutes yeah um i just just want to add something uh, to uh the question that uh, peter asked um I've, I've, i totally agree with what the two of you have, have said there um i mean ideally you want to try and process your uh, own black and white but if that's just not going to happen and there are lots of reasons and good reasons why that isn't going to happen then what right. i would suggest you do is uh, there's a there's another facebook group um for another podcast called the negative positives film photography podcast um and that's a it's a big friendly group and there are plenty of people in there from australia and i think that will be a great place to ask the question um, yeah as to uh, what professional uh, labs are available out there. I use, I use the word professional because I think there are some labs there that they've just got machinery and the stuff goes in and it's spewed out and it's sent off. I'm talking about, you know, places that really care and there won't be anywhere near as many as, as those. And if you can get some recommendations for the, for one of those places, then it's going to be well worth sending uh, your, your film off to them because you're going to get the service that's going to be close to what you might get uh, right. if you were doing it yourself. Yeah. And you're going to, and that's the thing at, at this point, you're going to spend almost the same developing film at a crappy lab as you will at a really good one. Yeah. yeah. So you, so you might, have, so seek out the good lab and pay, you know, a, a minuscule amount more perhaps for processing, but you'll get much better results. Yeah. So yeah, that's, that's good advice, Simon, for yeah. sure. And, and, and Johnny, I've got, I've got another quick question for you. Uh, local reseller shop, Somebody apparently dumped all of their film from their freezer, and the the reselling shop was, was like a recycle upcycle shop. Uh, had all of his rolls for two dollars a roll, so I ended up with a case of the uh, the Kodak was it TN four hundred? It was the Kodak version of the XP two. Yeah, XP two is just I think a lot better. Oh, it is because I I yeah, never I never I never shot this Kodak. Uh, yeah, it's version. like the. It's like the old uh, 400 BWCN, which is nice film, but it was not forgiving with overexposure, whereas uh, XP2 uh, is extremely forgiving. Okay. And I think that the contrast coming out of it, out of that film, out of just standard C41 developer is much more pleasing than, say, you know, Tri-X fed through generic black and white mini lab developer. It just... Sure. You know what I mean? Because it's kind of tuned to run through C41 to begin with. It ends up right. looking more like real black and white than actual black and white film. You know, right. you know in right. an odd way, the results are more predictable because it's meant to go through that kind of process. So, right. you know. Um, well, yeah. that, that might be i don't know if you if you if you mentioned that that re, uh, recommended that earlier, but that would be a good solution in itself, wouldn't it? Because you wouldn't have to necessarily take that to a, a top end uh, right. developer That's, as long as yeah. as long as the, as long as a place has got a reasonable throughput of uh, it, film and they change right. the chemicals often enough then it'll be as yeah. good as anywhere won't it because that's the whole point of it exactly exactly which is what i like about xp2 and i and i think it's a good solution for for that kind of situation in particular and i mean it, at least just to get a, a feel for it and then you can always yeah. do more once you've gotten a feel for it, right? But at least it will allow you to get started and get decent results. Yeah. yeah when I yeah. when I started grad school in the early '90s, I lost access to my darkroom, uh, and I shot the XP2 for a good six seven years as my primary black and white. And yeah. it's a great film. Yeah, it really is. Yeah. Yep. Okay, let's move on to uh, Fraser Yule, who wrote us on December twelfth. 
Frazier says, evening chaps, had an email in, wait, had to email in after listening jo- to a jo- great podcast. Jo- Johnny, Johnny, yeah. I, I know Fraser, and I think you should read this with a Scottish accent. Oh, please. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you I know can I can't, Simon. He'll love it. <laughs> I, I, I can do it in my head, but I can't make it come out of my mouth. It just doesn't happen. Okay. I can't do Scottish. No, you're you're quite right. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, it, it, it can't be any worse than 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 uh, Braveheart. <laughs> oh my God! Yeah, no good. Yeah, I kind of do Scottish. <laughs> All right. Just think of Gr- groundskeeper Willie. When you, when yeah, groundskeeper. <laughs> <laughs> I want you to kill all the golfers. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God! Okay. Even Japs had an email, had to email in after listening to a great podcast earlier in the week, number 96. Really enjoyed it. Just wanted to say, although the dynamic of the podcast has changed or rather evolved slightly over the past few months, you've gelled together as a great team. And I know that's not easy to do. In response to an email on the podcast, I appreciate there has been a wee direction change. And the talk is not all about lenses, which for me is fine. I like to hear what you have been up to, and I totally agree that other topics will creep into the conversation based on what's happening throughout the week. Again, that's fine with me as it's related to photography that's been happening and in many ways put a lot of images posted on social media into more context. Lengthwise, is longer not meant to be better, (laughs) or am I getting that confused with something else? Dot, dot, dot. Anyway, I sit in the car for long periods, um, at a time, and I find the longer podcast better. I know that's a selfish opinion, but I know a good few others that share it too. One thing I do miss are Carl's mid podcast <laughs> mid podcast gas farts. <laughs> Buying lenses on eBay as they are discussed always made me laugh. He always managed to get them before we even knew about them. Uh, keep up the good work, chaps and Perry. Try to avoid the tear gas. Can't be, uh, can't be any fun, that stuff. Loving the images you've been posting, although at the same time, it's a terrible situation um, uh, that you are able to get them in the first place. But has to have been mentioned before, your documentation of the troubles will be well worth it in the future. Well-deserved Kofi donation has been left for you all. Merry Christmas when it comes, unless, of course... This gets around, gets read around the new year, in which case, happy Easter. Cheers, Fraser. Thank you very much for that, Fraser. Well, if it's, if it's any consolation, the, the last lens that I borrowed from Carl was his, 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 his Nikkor, uh, 24 2.8. And I am currently stalking one on eBay. I'm just I'm <laughs> waiting for the end of the auction, watching it click down as we're doing this podcast. So Excellent. Great. Lens I am too. shooting for that, that 24, 2.8 right now. Um, I just, just want to say something about Fraser as well, because um, I mentioned last week, I was at the viewing and photo walk in Worcester in, in the UK uh, for the one shot inch and down hosted by Hamish Gill and his 35 MMC thing. Uh, actually, no, it's nothing to do with the 35 MMC. It's his co-working space called the kill. And, There was a question and answer session after the showing of the one shot inch and down or tanky one shot. And uh, Fraser came out with um, easily the best observation um, of the film, which I'm not going to go into, but you can hear Fraser uh, on the current sort of 16 podcast, uh, which is all about uh, that, that day. Uh, ah, so, cool. um, so uh, yeah, do once you finish this, do head over to the Sunday Sixteen podcast and uh, and listen to this this week's show. Does he does he order any food in Scottish accents? No, no. Okay. But, you, but but you will you will hear somebody with a with a, a Borders Scot a Borders accent, and uh, that is Fraser. So um, yeah, <laughs> that, that was uh, that was that was a good moment. And uh, actually, that that just reminds me on the subject of uh, Sunday Sixteen. I thought you were going to say on the subject of a haggis. No, no, oh, okay. you, could, you could imagine that, couldn't you? But um, yeah, uh, but no, not not in this case or tartan uh, for that matter. Okay. Although, although Fraser is a big fan of tartan, uh, just just saying that you know. Um, but uh, yes, yeah, Sunday sixteen, they are now taking uh, votes for their Sunny Awards, and I think they're actually in year four of the Sunnies. 
uh, where they have various categories which uh, people can uh, vote on um, for things like your favourite film, and which will be almost certainly Ilford HP5 because it always is. Mm-hmm. Um, and um and and other things but there's also uh, categories in there for favorite podcast uh which is an interesting one and i think you should all vote for the homemade camera podcast because that's my favorite at the moment um but if you have other favorites and you wish to vote to the sunnies then um i don't know where the uh the, the site is actually i imagine if you if you follow sunny 16 on twitter sunny sort of 16 podcast then go back through his uh, post and you will actually see a link to uh, to the studies and there's a google form and you can just fill fill that out so uh um yeah so i'll urge you all to uh to go out there and uh and fill that out and it'll be interesting to see what the the results will be in when is it uh, january i think the the results come out and uh as I've already just pointed somebody towards the Sunday Six, uh, not Sunday Sixteen, uh, Negative Positives podcast uh, Facebook group. They've got a campaign uh, on that page to make sure that they win it. Um, so uh, there you go. Um, so yeah, head over, head over into one of those places and um, and vote. Well, we're through the email. Um, we're okay. actually. I guess we're actually. Caught, I guess we're caught up for the for the moment. We are. We we, yeah. we have. Um, and um, I guess sticky feely. My my shout outs actually might be a little bit longer this week, so I think let's quickly do uh, coffee donations because I forgot completely uh, to mention coffee last week, uh, which is not very good of me. Um, so I'm just going to do a quick rundown of people that have donated to us, going back to the eighth of December, possibly the seventh. Um, in fact, let's just check those days. So the seventh was a Saturday. So I can't remember anyway. I'm going to say I might be saying these people again. Um, so James Thorpe, thank you very much. Uh, on the 8th of December, Shia Morrison uh, donated to us uh, and he said only three coffees because Johnny couldn't join us due to bowel stroke internet problems. <laughs> uh, thank you, Shia. Um, Dan Dodd on the 10th of December. Um, uh, I was going to say voted for us there, but uh, he he dropped uh, he dropped some money in the pot for us and said if Trump was a camera he'll be a Nikonos uh, Nikonos five uh, oh, imper- no. impervious to his surroundings and bright orange. <laughs> <laughs> I love my Nikonos five. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so, so thank you, Dan. Um, uh, Brian Woolworth uh, donated to us again. Uh, Ulf Ulf. S. <laughs> yeah, I'm trying. To, I shouldn't be doing that. Actually, Ulf. That's how I'd say it locally, but um, it's probably more like Ulf. Um, thank. That we, of course, that, that was very good, Simon. Yeah, yeah but it could be. It could be in the states. I mean, how would you say that in the states? I mean, I've, I've no Ulf. idea. Ulf, Ulf, Ulf. Yeah. So um, on the. So uh, thank you, thank you, Ulf. Um, uh, and uh, say so thank you, guys, um, for your wonderful work and providing the the, the pinnacle of my week. You must have a pretty poor week, Ulf. Um, <laughs> if we're the top <laughs> part of it. Um, and uh, finally, uh, Fraser Yule. Um, two mentions this week uh, and goes, "Have a coffee on me." Uh, well, a, <laughs> well, a dram. Um, would be would be better. Um, none of that malort stuff. Um, uh, <laughs> be meaning to donate to you uh, to you guys for weeks uh, or for a while. Um, thanks for a great podcast. Always informative and enjoyable. Merry Christmas when when it comes. Cheers, Fraser, and a Merry Christmas to you, Fraser. And I can say we will be on again before Christmas. So, uh, in fact, Christmas in the New Year are not bothering us at all this year, are they? We, we're just going to plow straight through as normal. Johnny. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. We'll am, I supposed, am I supposed to do shout outs now? Um yeah, let's let's do some shout let's do some shout outs, yeah. <laughs> uh, um our guest, uh, Anthony. Um have you got any shout outs you want to give? Well, only I mean looking back at the end of the year, you know, reading that email, uh the uh, who the guy who had shot the 42 lenses this year i counted uh how many cameras that i had shot this year like just dis- like distinctly different cameras and i was at 47 cameras oh. uh that i shot this year and that would not be possible without the support of cheyenne morrison <laughs> and mike novak and mike ekman who have you know behind the scenes egged me on uh with because they know i like 
like oddball cameras and fixed lens cameras and folders. And they're, they're you know, whenever they see one that they're not interested in themselves, they, you, know, you, you should check this out. I think you'd like it. And they're right. Of course. And they <laughs> end up buying it. Um, yeah. So the three of them are, they, they really uh, changed my year this year uh, and, and, and opened my eyes to a number of cameras I would have never have considered otherwise. And I've just had so much fun. I mean, every time I get a new camera, it's just like, to me, it's just a joy to figure it out and to find out how to, to take the best possible shot with that camera, even with, you know, a lot of these have some pretty serious limitations, uh, but you know, generally I can coax something out of them that make it worthwhile. And uh, so, yeah, that, they made 2019 a whole lot of fun. Fantastic. And they, and Was they, that they, yeah. 47 or 427? Because uh, I've the, shot four two seven cameras this year, but nowhere near 47. No, I uh, four forty seven. <laughs> Almost fifty d- different cameras in 2019. <laughs> uh, That's awesome. I, yeah, I wish I could even get anywhere near that. That's great. And, and and you know some of them have been loners, but most of them not much to Janet's chagrin. But uh, every time a new box shows up, she just kind of rolls her eyes. Yeah. Like, really? <laughs> but uh, yeah, forty-seven. Wow. All right. So any of those have you gone back to? I I rotate through all of them. There's only a couple of them that I find that, that I, I just really don't enjoy shooting. You know, like I just I shot another roll through the the Voigtlander VF135, which is uh, is it a, a Roli VF VX? It's it's a, it's, a, it's a, it was like one of the last cameras that they branded as Voigtlander when Roli owned the brand, and it's got a uh, it's a fixed lens camera that just it's it's you know they, they, people talk about the fact that it's a sonar variant. They call it a color scoper X. I just that camera and I do not get along. You know, it's just it feels cheap. It's too automated. Don't like it. Um, but other than that, a couple of them I'm looking over my list right now. You know, I I only ran in like one roll through a 1930s Voigtlander Brilliant uh, because like once I did it, I kind of it was like a one trick pony and I kind of got it. Uh, but other than that, I've been shooting all of this stuff. Yeah. No, wow. I mean, there's, there's, there's very few that I don't, and some, and some that, that, you know, some that have been just like complete surprises, like early in the year, one of the first cameras that I bought in this year was uh, on Johnny's advice was the, uh, the Konica auto reflex. Oh, and like man, it's just like, every time I just want like a, a happy place, I pick that camera up <laughs> and, you know, in, in both in half frame mode and full frame mode, that camera, there's just something about that camera that I just love shooting. Yeah. I love that camera. Yeah, it's just and and some that I, I some that I I like. I've got a Spotmatic F that I picked up. It, it was kind of rough. It was like twelve dollars, and I and I, I bought it because I wanted an M forty two platform because I really I didn't have a good M forty two platform, and I've I've never gelled with that camera, but I keep on using it because I keep on finding cool lenses for it. Okay. Yeah, I just well actually I just bought that uh the the. Oh, what was the one I just bought, Johnny? It was uh, it was I bought it from on your recommendation. Was it the thirty five Super Decamar? Oh, the thirty five three point five. Yeah, 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 yeah. I just, oh, yeah. I, that, that came from Japan. Oh, cool. Yeah, and, I love and, that lens. And, and I've I've got that I've got that camera loaded up with uh, um, Velvia fifty right now, and I need to finish off that roll to oh, check nice. out how that lens did. But yeah, it was a blast to shoot with that lens. That lens is nice. Yeah, cool. I, I checked it out first on my K1 and then threw it on the Spotmatic and it's, it's a, it's a nice lens, <laughs> but yeah. So in, in all of them, like even the, even the oddball ones, like I completely fell head over heels for the universal Mercury two, the CX. You know, I thought it was, I mean, I always liked it cause it's like a, a steampunk looking weirdo camera. And I like that sort of thing. I like that aesthetic. I like these like design dead ends and, and it, like you know, it has that rotary shutter in it that, that actually torques the camera when you shoot it because it's, it's a, a giant metal disc that's spinning for a shutter. Um, and it has a very, like you talked about shutter sounds, the shutter sound on that Mercury is like, zzzz, it almost sounds like an SX 70. Um, but even with this like Wollen sack 3.5 Tessar variant, beautiful beautiful photographs out of that camera like shockingly cool photographs nice. uh, so yeah these are all cameras like i mean there, there's a place for all of them right okay well uh johnny yeah. have you got any shout outs oh i 
I probably do, but it, as usual, they're not they're not top of mind. I haven't written anything haven't written anything down for shout outs this week. So um I, I could give a shout out to my cat sitter. Yeah. Because <laughs> that because I that was like took so much stress off my mind uh traveling and my poor old cat staying home. Uh so that that's what I'm super thankful for this week. <laughs> it's the cat sitter. <laughs> well, you can mention her name then. Go on. Uh, no, you know I don't know if I am actually because I think she's like semi-retired. I almost had to bribe her to all right. start, drive all the way out west to where I live in Chicago, uh, out of her service area to watch after my cat and my goldfish while I was in California. So. So I, you know what I, I will, I will give a shout out to actually, I'm going to give a shout out to the TSA, the good <laughs> folks at TSA who, who, um, both in Chicago and at, uh, Ontario airport in, uh, California, um, were very accommodating hand checking my film. No problem whatsoever. Put all my film in a baggie, and they gladly went through it all and checked it, and it made it made it uh, super easy and way low stress. Um, so, thank you to the TSA for being film friendly. Did they have one of those new CT scanners there, or were they just normal scanners? Um, I think they're just the normal ones with yeah. the uh, uh, you know that go down the conveyor belt. There, I think they're still the normal ones, and they have the ones that you stand in, of course, for the the body scan. Um, yeah. Uh, but, but the, they, they still, they, they, somebody mentioned in Chicago that, Oh, it's only for 800 speed film. Like they were talking between themselves, a couple of screeners. Uh, but even it's funny because even in the, uh, in the line that, that big windy, you know, the big windy line that goes up to the screening checkpoints, there was actually a sign. I should have taken a photo of the sign, but the sign said, we're glad to hand check your film. It's, it's, it said something like, um, uh, you know, film is, if you prefer to have your film hand checked that that's, so there was actually a sign that's in the line about, about, film being hand checked it was probably right next to the sign that said no photos in the scanning or in the screening area uh, yeah <laughs> yeah um you know no actually you know what they apparently you can't even do that you can even do some some photography apparently just not in the screening area but you can do it in the line so i could have taken a photo of the sign <laughs> in the line but i was a little too stressed at that moment so but anyway that yeah they were very accommodating and i'm i'm really I'm really thankful to them for that. So cool. Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, I've got a few shout outs and the first one I need, this, this goes back some time actually. So it's a bit remiss of me for not doing it before I've uh, put something up into Facebook and Twitter, but I just want to say thanks to uh, big Mike of the, um, Oh, what's the dark room he's got over there in Hawaii. Um, well, anyway, it's big Mike, a low hat, big Mike on the, uh, Instagram, at least, uh, he's got a, a dark room in uh, Hawaii, and he sent me a postcard from Hawaii, which was absolutely lovely. Um, some palm trees, and uh, and it was looking really, really nice. So thank you very, very much for that. There's, uh, and you've got decent handwriting as well, far better than my appalling handwriting. So I, I envy you there, Mike. So thank you very much for that. That was that was great. Um, I love things. his Instagram feed. Yeah. I love his photographs. They're really cool. They are. They yeah, are. It's a really cool, really cool feed. Yeah, I, I, I mean that's the thing. He lives in Hawaii. He he could be a model if he wants to be. He's a fireman. He's got a dark room, and there are palm trees. I mean, what a life! Yeah, yeah, yeah. What could you say? Nice. Um, yeah. Okay. So uh, other other shout outs. I want to say thank you to Jonathan Crowther, who's a, one of our listeners. Uh, because he has donated to the Six Towns, Six Towns Dark Room uh, a box of film. Um, and it's cold store film. So, yes, it's expired, you know. And I get, get told off issues an expired film and so on. But, you know, if, it's, if it works, it works. So, so shoot it. And uh, especially if it's being cold stored as well, then, then you've, you've, you're pretty much safe to go. Uh, so he's, he's donated a box of film. Um, 
that's got lots of film in it is perhaps a better way of putting it. Um, some some um, bulk loading rolls that so we can bulk load film, which is which is really cool to have those as well, and some really odd film in there. One one of which um, it tells me is it's hand. I think it must be hand cut and hand rolled, and it's also the 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 emulsion that's on it is paper emulsion, photographic paper emulsion on a roll of film. Um, no idea if it's going to work or not, wow. um, but it sounds intriguing, and that's going to be that's going to be incredibly low ISO as well. I assume it's going to be like about six, maybe. What do you think? Yeah, probably. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, yeah, could be uh, could be interesting on that one. Um, so thank you very much for that, Jonathan. Um, and that's going to go off to the, the Six Times Dark Room where we like to give film away. So if anybody comes along, uh, wants to come along to the Six Times Dark Room, uh, just get in touch with me. We, we meet every Tuesday night, although the one tomorrow is the last time before we break up for Christmas and then we're back in the first week, or is it the second week? We'll be back early January anyway. And, um, yeah, we're more than happy to give film away to people who want to give uh, give film a go uh, we might even have a couple of cameras that people can use as well so um that's the six towns dark room in stoke on trent and uh, again uh, thank you jonathan there um also on the subject this is going back to where i started really the reason why i took that plug hole shot was because i was on the way to see a chap called stephen segersby who probably won't be that familiar to, to listeners of this this podcast as he's a large format shooter and he was a guest a previous guest on the large format photography podcast and and he has uh, just donated uh, a large format um, and larger a, De a devere 705 uh, which is so that's a seven by five inch negative it will it will take so you know bigger than four by five and uh, uh oh. excuse me there. that was uh, that was brian from the six times dark room ringing me at the wrong time <laughs> um and uh yeah so he he's donated this uh this fantastic and larger uh to us and i took a trip up to his house and uh i, I uh, had a tour of his dark room and what a place that is he's got a, a devere oh, i forget what number it is but it's a ten, it's a 10 by 8 uh in larger this just enormous it's like it's like robbie the robot um, in, out of that, out of that um, sci-fi film, it's it's just just incredible. It's floor, floor standing, attached to the wall, huge head on it, and you know, and he's also got you know some. Oh, I, I'm talking large format now, so I'll I'll uh, put that to one side. But thank you, um, uh, Stephen, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in the the next uh, LFPP. And I just want to give a shout out to the large format photography podcast because with last week we interviewed uh, a, a large format and other uh, does other systems as well. But really, the actual yeah, the equipment didn't really matter um, because we interviewed somebody called Kate Miller Wilson, and uh, it's well well worth heading over to instagram to look to her feed because she just takes some amazing photographs they're mainly family orientated but there's just something special about every single photograph she takes um, and that was a that was a really good chat so uh have a have a listen to that if you if you feel that you you want to an antidote to gear talk and want to talk they want to hear a little bit more about you know the thoughts going behind photography i think that's a, a great one to listen to with uh with andrew bartman as my uh co-host on that one um, well, simon for of all of the hundreds of cameras i've shot through my entire life other than pinhole i've never shot large, large format and so i think that that my my goal for 2020 is to take the plunge oh excellent. is, is I've, i i you know i don't know whether i'm going to get a speed graphics or what i'll what i'll pick up but uh, this is going to be 2020 is the year when I when I take the plunge and 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 try a field camera. Fantastic. Well, hit hit me up on that one, and we'll have a chat about that because there's yeah. uh, there are so many cameras. It's it's another, every every you know, talk about rabbit holes. Every <laughs> every, every area of photography, you, the, it just as soon as you think, oh, that looks interesting, and then bam, it's an enormous subject, and then you go on to look yeah. at developing. It's an enormous subject, and printing. It's an enormous subject. You know, and uh, so it's 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 fascinating. Uh, and large format photography, I, I love it at the moment. Um, and uh, yeah, I'd be more than happy to help you out on on that one. Well, thank you. Um, I'll, I'm sure I'll take you up on that. Cool. Cool. And uh, the last shout out, I'm going to shout out for M uh, of Emulsive. And actually, that's a point. I don't, 
in the in response to the letter we had earlier about uh, resources, I forgot. I was going to say it, and I've, I've forgotten about it. But uh, if you check out emulsive.org, which is, I, I think it's got to be the largest single resource for analog photography on the internet. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, there was just almost all of film photography is on there in some shape or form. Um, loads of advice, loads of guides on, on film. Um, he's actually got a, an article on there that has information on, I think, every single film stock that's available today. I think that's actually the name of the article. Um, so that's a, that's a great place to, uh, to, to start to look and, and learn. So uh, that's emulsive.org. Uh, but I'm giving a shout out to M uh, because um, he was very excited today on Twitter uh, where he found that uh, Hasselblad had, had started to follow him. That's the Hasselblad with a blue tick. Um, and he was uh, particularly happy about that. So I, I congratulated him on that and, um, and suggested that perhaps they should have followed me when I did my Somblad uh, <laughs> experiment earlier this, this, this year. Um, <clears throat> and, and then decided to try and outdo me on that one and, sh and posted the picture as, uh, what was it called? Uh, Hassel, Hasselblad Blad, I think it was, or some, something on those lines where he, he managed to stick two bodies together um, to try and outdo my Somblad, which is um, my version, that w which works uh, where I put a, uh, my Sony a7 onto the back of the uh, of a Hasselblad 500 CM. Um, and I just, just wish to say, Em, if you're, if you're listening, um, Hasselblad liked my Somblad, but they didn't actually put a like against yours. So that's, <laughs> um, I think that says everything there. So um, they might not be following me, but they preferred my Somblad. So uh, that's made me happy. So that's my shout outs for this week. Plenty of them. Um, okay, so we're at the end of the show. Um, Anthony, it's been a, a joy to have you back. Uh, thanks. Oh, thank you. I, I, I just love yeah, definitely. chatting about all this. Yeah, no. Th thanks for taking the time out, and uh, um, we'll let's let's talk about the places that uh, people can follow you. And I, my first question is going to be though to you is: uh, Can you recommend anywhere in Gainesville for a, for a great coffee and uh, you know, <laughs> yeah. Volta Coffee, co chocolate, Volta Coffee, tea, and chocolate is is where I go every day. So people can go for a conversation with you at Volta yeah, Coffee. Yep, yeah, Volta Coffee, tea, and chocolate. Uh, we sell we sell Cosmo Bono film. We you know we're the only shop in the only place in town where you can physically walk in and buy film, black and white film, off the shelf. And we got it one you know one twenty and uh, thirty five millimeter. Awesome. And uh, maybe I'll be able to pick up some more. They were talking about trying to open me up with Cinestill, but I think they've been having some supply issues. Yeah, uh, yeah, so just a bit. Never never been able to pick that up. Um, but oh, find me on. Um, on, on uh, Instagram, I'm Kino underscore Pravda. Uh, and there was a long story about that covered on the last episode. That's that right. The, the Kardashians stole your Kardashians stole your name. Kardashians stole my name and gave yeah. it to their to the baby yep. Kardashian. Uh, and then on, on Flickr, where I actually um, I create albums for every camera that I test with, with samples from the cameras and from the different lenses. And uh, that's uh, Dasein Design, D-A-S-E-I-N D-E-S-I-G-N. Uh, or you can just search my name on uh, on Flickr, which I still use Flickr. Uh, it's, it's been very useful for uh, keeping this you know running diary of, of the different cameras. Cool. And that's it. Okay. Well, thank you again. And Johnny, how about you? Oh, uh, you can. Well, you don't want to follow me anywhere right now. That's fine. We'll save that for another time. Um, you can uh, send the podcast to you can, uh, you can send an email to the podcast at classic lenses podcast at gmail.com. You can also, of course, follow the podcast at uh, classic lenses podcast.com. And on Instagram, you can go to best vintage lens and you can see uh, photos taken with vintage lenses there as well as uh seeing the notes for each uh, show that happen in a somewhat timely manner so be sure to check that out um, and you can uh, you can meet me at uh, Central Camera Company in Chicago most days of the week so say hello to me there okay and if people want to share anything this kind of thing related on Instagram I did Instagram did you did you do did we do I snuck it right in there did you I get snuck it right in there the best, best vintage, vintage lens. I completely yeah. missed that. 
Ah, I got it. So snuck it right in there in one big breath. Um, well, what no. you can do, however, is you can you can. <laughs> I was going to say we've made it all bigger now. Anyway, that that that's yeah. uh, my my lapse of. Uh, uh, thought there is has made the best vintage lens not best yeah it is best vintage lens on instagram even more popular now let's hope yes yes and be sure to go and i uh, guess watch the caption live captions of the podcast over on youtube uh check check that out so you can find classic lenses podcast on youtube as well excellent excellent so then for me I'm on Twitter as Simon4, that's Simon with F-O-R at the end of it. I'm on Instagram as Simon Forster Photographic. Um, I'm sort of on Flickr, but I don't really do that much anymore, so we can forget about that one. Um, the music for the show is by Kevin McLeod of Incompetech.com. It's called October Blues. Um, that's it. So I hope you've enjoyed this week's show, and it'd be great if you can join us again next week. So if you can... Be like home.